the birth of King Messiah. And I'm going to show you scripturally how he was born today on Sukkot. And I'm going to give you all Bible proof for all of this. So let's begin with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the priestly division of Abijah. He had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elisheba, or Elizabeth, as we know her. Okay, and then look at Luke 1, verse 8 and 9. It says, Now it happened while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. There were hundreds of thousands of sons of Aaron that were priests. Now, how many of you know, like if you're in the NBA or you're playing basketball and uh, you're on one of the teams, do you want to sit on the bench or do you want to be in the game? You want to be in the game. Well, a lot of these priests, uh, when you do the math, uh, for example, the lighting of the menorah inside the holy place is done twice a day. Over a year, it'd be roughly 700 times. Okay, well, if you're a priest for, uh, let's say, 20 years, okay, that's 70 years times, I mean, you come out to about 14,000 times or whatever. But there's hundreds of thousands of priests. So you may never in your entire life get to burn the incense inside the temple. So they had a lottery system. They would draw lots, and you could only offer it once in your entire life. Once you offered it, you could never do it again. You had to go do something else. And so he won the lottery uh, in order to uh, go into the holy place. But it says he, had, he did it exactly according to the division of his course. And it was according to the division of Abijah. So let's go to 1 Chronicles 24, verse 1 and 2, and verse 19 to find out when that happened. It says, these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, it goes on to say, Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer and Itamar. Nadab and Abihu died, had no children. Therefore, Eliezer and Itamar executed the priest's office. Notice the exact same phraseology as in Luke. And then it says in 1 Chronicles 24.10 that the seventh course went to Hakoz and the eighth course went to who? Abijah. So that means he was the eighth course. And then look at verse 19. It says, These were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner under Aaron their father as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. So everything was done according to the course. Well, let's take a look at this. Roughly, Nisan 1 begins the religious year. And they would all serve one week, twice a year. There were 24 courses. You take 24 times 2, you get 48 weeks. But the three weeks of all the festivals going on, Passover, Pentecost, and Sukkot, all the priestly courses would serve, which gives you your 51 weeks with the lunar cycle. Uh, that's how that works out. But the first course would serve the first week. So I just put April 1st where Nisan was, is for simplicity's sake. The second course would serve the second week. But now comes Passover week, all right? And so every course would serve the third week, and then the third course would serve that last week of April. And so if you served the second course, you had to serve two weeks in a row. If you served the third course, you had to serve two weeks in a row. You had to serve with all the priests for Passover week and then the following week. Okay, so then the fourth course, fifth, sixth, seventh, and now we come to June. Zechariah begins his course the first week of June as the eighth course. But guess what happens? Then comes Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost. And so Zechariah also had to serve an extra week. So he served two full weeks. And then he could go home and meet his wife. That would be the ninth course and the tenth course as it goes on. But look at Luke 1, verse 10 and 11. It says the whole multitude, and I believe the Greek word here is plethora, where we get many thousands and thousands of people were there praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Okay, he, wanted, he, was, he won the lottery to burn the incense, not like the menorah, but to do the incense. Okay, now what's fascinating about this, why do you think there was a whole multitude of people there? It was the Feast of Pentecost. 
Okay, they're not going to be there. The only time you're going to have a whole multitude of people is uh, during one of the three pilgrimage feasts. And so this again is confirming not only the eighth course, but also that it was the feast of Shabbat. And then in verse 23 and 24, it says it happened when the days of his service were fulfilled and he had to do two weeks. And so can you imagine that second week he couldn't talk. The whole second week that he was there serving, he couldn't even talk. And then it says, uh, he departed to his house, and after these days, uh, Elisheva, his wife conceived, and she hid herself for how long? Five months. Okay. If we are looking, let's go back, if we are here in the to the end, middle to the end of June, and she hides herself five months, end of July, August, September, October, November. She, she hid herself till the end of November. And now look at Luke 1.26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth. Okay, so now we are at the end of December, which is at the time of Hanukkah. Wow, it's the sixth month. It says in Luke 1, 35 and 36, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And then look at Luke 1, 35 and 36. The angel tells Miriam, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born from you will be called the Son of God. Behold, Elisheva, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Wow, the end of December was the sixth month for Elizabeth. Now look at verse 56. Miriam stays with her about three more months. Why do you think she stayed with her three more months? Until she delivers the baby. Okay, it's the end of December. You go three more months, all of January, all of February, all of March. It takes you right to the end of March, the 1st of April, which puts John the Baptist being born at Passover. All right? Wow, look how this is all tied to the feast. And now look at this. If uh, let's look at Luke 2, 6 and 7. And it says, And so it was, while they were there, the dates were accomplished, she should be delivered. And this is referring to Miriam. And it says, She would brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. All right, well, let's look at this now. Let's think for a minute. If Miriam conceives during Hanukkah, which is also known as the light of the world. So here the light of the world, Yeshua, is conceived during Hanukkah. At the end of December, if you add nine months for her, that puts him being born nine months later at the end of September, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. Do you see how simple this is biblically? Now here's what's amazing. Get, why do you think there was no room in the inn? Hello? That's why there's no room in the inn. How many of you want to go to Alaska in the middle of winter? They go to Arizona, okay? I have a friend of mine uh, who lives uh, in Russia, uh, northern Russia, about a 10-hour uh, train ride north of Moscow, and he's been wanting me to come out and speak. You know, when? He says, well, in February. And it's like, I'm not going to the middle of Siberia in February. You know, he goes, well, that's when everybody comes. They don't come in the summer because then they have to work their potato farm. They don't come. They always come in the winter. There's nothing else to do, you know. Uh, but it's, it's the same thing. This is why there was no room in the inn because it was at the Feast of Tabernacles and there's thousands of people there. I mean, everything uh, makes sense. And then guess what? Those, the word swaddling clothes in the Greek literally means to be wrapped in strips. Remember the worn out priestly garments that were stained with the sacrifices were cut into strips. So Yeshua was wrapped in priestly garments that were stained with our sin. That was the swaddling clothes that he was wrapped in. And then uh, what do we find? I want you to realize they would put sukkahs all over the Mount of Olives, all over Jerusalem. Everybody built sukkahs. Okay. And they would all dwell in them for the seven days because they had to dwell in booths. Remember that three times? You have to dwell in booths. So all over Israel, first a coat, they have all these sukkahs set up and people dwell in those sukkahs. Now let's remember Miriam's song at the sea. Remember I told you about that? The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. Look at the next words. He is my God. I will prepare him a habitation. 
This is the whole concept of building a sukkah is not only for you, but you're preparing him a place to dwell. And so look at verse 1 uh, of Psalm 118. Look at what everyone is singing on Yeshua's birthday. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation, the voice of rejoicing, and Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous. So right here in this one little Sukkot in Bethlehem, there is Yeshua in the tabernacles of the righteous, and that's what they're singing. God pre-planned the happy birthday song for Yeshua a thousand years in advance. He said, they will rejoice. Why do you think God said you have to rejoice during the Feast of Sukkot? Because that's when Yeshua was going to be, re- be born. And so now, little do they know, there's a million people in Jerusalem all singing happy birthday to Yeshua, and they don't even know he's there. And again, this is why it's called Simchat Torah. The rejo- he is the living Torah. Now, look at this. Uh, in Psalm 118, verse 24 and 5. Remember during tabernacles, they were commanded to rejoice. And it says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And then they would say, save now, I beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, send now prosperity. Now, what's also crazy is look at this. Here's all these sheep, okay? Luke 2, verse 8 through 11. There were shepherds in the same country staying in the field, keeping watch by night over their flock. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. And the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of what? And this is the time of greatly rejoicing, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah the Lord. Now, I tell you what, right now, if you've been to Israel, okay, in the, win- in the summer it's very hot, and in the winter is when all the winter rains come, and there's heavy rains and there's snow. Now, if you were a shepherd watching your sheep at night, do you want to be out in the middle of December in the winter? Okay, no, you're not going to happen. That is not going to happen. As a matter of fact, that's Nazareth up north. And uh, let me go to this little application. Let me go back one, do this. Okay, right here is Nazareth. Okay, and clear down here is uh, Bethlehem, right down here. It's about... 40 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, if you really cared about Yeshua being born and his mother and father, are you going to make them ride a camel for 40 miles in the middle of winter uh, when there's snow and everything else? Or are you going to have them ride when it's nice in the month of September with groups of thousands of people as they all travel together uh, to the Feast of Sukkot? I tell you what, it's, it snows in Jerusalem in winter. There's no way Jesus was born the end of December because then there would have been plenty of room in the inn. The shepherds aren't out in the middle of winter. And can you imagine having to go 40 miles on a camel or a donkey when you're nine months pregnant? That is not very nice. <laughs> and I, I don't think the Lord would have done that. But what happens... That's a coat. The entire city, everyone comes together. They travel together for safety and everything else. So here, what happens for Joseph and Miriam? When it's time to be taxed and time for Messiah to be born, everyone travels together to get there in time for the feast. But the thing is, uh, you know, they would all be coming together. They're all building their sukkahs. But that's why there was no room in the inn. And then look at John 1, 14. It says, the word was made flesh. And what did he do? Wow. Look at that. He tabernacled among us at the feast of tabernacles. We behold his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And then look at Luke 2, 13. It says, suddenly there was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Wow. And now look at Luke 2, 21. It says when the eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child. His name was called Yeshua, which was given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Children are given their name on the eighth day. Hmm. Tabernacles is seven days long, and then there's this special eighth day. And eighth day is the day they are circumcised. So here, he is shedding his blood, fulfilling the covenant to Abraham on the eighth day of Simchat Torah. 
Do you see the connections? Everything points to Yeshua being born at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, uh, one of the things that's uh, just amazing to me, and I, you know, I, I believe in celebrating his birth. Well, let's do it when it happens. Uh, put a crash in your sukkah, okay? That's right. But now let me show you something that is even more incredible, and we'll close with this. Look at Luke 22 through 24. Let's go to this last PowerPoint slide. You can see here they are. They're bringing him into the temple. Uh, it says, when the days of their purification, according to the Torah of Moses, was fulfilled, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the Torah of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. To offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the Torah of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Okay, now, everything was done according to Torah. Isn't that what it says? So how many believe it was done according to Torah? Okay, and it says they were to offer a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. But you know what we need to do? We need to go to the Torah of the Lord to see exactly what it says, right? We've got to check everything out. Look at Leviticus 12, we're going to look at verse 6 and verse 8. It talks about a mother, when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring what? A lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove. So what's missing? A lamb. Well, so what, did she do something wrong? No, let's read the rest of the Bible. It says, for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle, the congregation to the priest... And then it says this, if she's not able to bring a lamb, in other words, if she's too poor and she can't afford a lamb, then she can bring the two turtle doves or the two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest will make an atonement for her and she shall be clean. So here's the thing. They were to bring a lamb and a turtle dove or a lamb and a pigeon, but if they were too poor, this is also, you see, it's 30 days after he's born. You know what this also tells you? The three magi weren't there at his birth because they'd had all kinds of money with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They didn't show up at his birth. They didn't show up for a couple of years, okay? But what this does show you, now can you imagine if you were so blessed as Mary and Joseph, I mean, all of us wish we had more we could give to the Lord. And here they are so poor, they can't afford a lamb when they come. But little did they know, they had a lamb. They had the lamb of God. And to me, that is just what is so incredible. And so today, the rest of this week, we're going to party. We're going to rejoice and be thankful that Yeshua was born and celebrate his birthday with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. The worship team comes up. Let's stand and we'll pray and then we'll go home and we are going to rejoice. How many of you think, uh, this is how I know there's a God. No one can tell me there's not a God. When I can see he pre-writes the funeral hymns for his son's death a thousand years in advance. He writes the birthday songs for his son a thousand years in advance. I mean, this is so incredible to know that we serve a God who is in the details. And know if he, know, he knows all about you. He knows all of your needs. And he knows that maybe right now you're too poor and you can't afford some things. Well, I want you to, no matter what, you rejoice with what God has given you. And I'm telling you what, it will change radically your life. Let's pray. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King. We just worship you and praise you. And we want to rejoice on your birthday with you. We know they're rejoicing in heaven during the Feast of Tabernacles because you commanded them to rejoice as well. And we want your will that's being done in heaven to be done here on earth. This is a dress rehearsal, this feast, for the coming of the great king, when you will rule and reign for a thousand years, and you're going to make every single nation come up and wish you happy birthday uh, from all over the world, and to worship you and to praise you. Otherwise, they won't get any rain. So, Father, we're thankful for the rain that we have here in Seattle. We're thankful for all those nations around the world that are live streaming in over 200-some cities right now with us. We pray a blessing upon their nations. Father, may all of our nations turn toward you and turn toward your Torah. And, uh, Father, we just thank you that we have an opportunity even now to come to Jerusalem and to worship the King. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen.